Broadway beat. Broadway. Broadway beat. Broadway beat. Broadway beat. Broadway. Listen to the Broadway beat. Broadway. Hello, I'm Richard Ridge, and welcome to Broadway Beat, where we bring you the very best of what the New York theater scene has to offer. This week, we visit a thriller, a vaudeville, and a human comedy. Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Horton Foote is back with his latest, Dividing the Estate at the Booth Theater. Under the direction of Michael Wilson, the show welcomes home to Broadway Elizabeth Ashley. We'll also drop by the West Side Theater to chat with the company of Dust, the new thriller by Billy Goda. But let's start things off at the York Theater to give you a look at the new musical My Vaudeville Man about tap dancer Jack Donahue. The musical runs at the York through January 4th. Sean Wiley stars as eccentric tap dancer Jack Donahue, and Karen Murphy plays his mother, who fights to keep her son off the wicked vaudeville stage. The musical is directed and choreographed by Lynn Taylor Corbett. I'm the biggest fan. I think what attracted me to the piece was the possibility of illuminating, uh, uh, well, first of all, it's about second chances for me and um, a mother-son relationship that was so complex and so um, th both of those people were so caught in history, the Irish immigrant mother and the kid, you know, just trying to get away from, you know, the life his father led in the shipyard and um, trying to tell that story in a meaningful way with a lot of entertainment was... A huge challenge, and I, I, it was just important to me. I think the the largest challenge in 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 staging a piece that was based on letters is creating an offstage life for the characters that really impacted on these characters, the father, the priest, um, just the way that they were affected by characters we don't see, which w is difficult because you don't want to talk endlessly about people that you never see. But the truth is that our lives are not a void, and um, these people were incredibly informed by people that aren't out there. And so it was creating text and staging and reactions to people um, that were also part of the story, just not visible parts of the story. Come on! Can't keep up with the big boys. Son, you tap till you can't tap no more. Son, go back to your room. Don't forget to lock the door. Okay, well, um, Jack Donahue was a vaudevillian uh, turn of the century, last century. Um, he was as big a star as Brad Pitt. Um, he wrote a series of letters to his mother um, and published it in 1930 called Letters of a Hoofer to His Ma. And uh, they're, they're fun little incidences with him running off and spending his money. And um, ja uh, there's tons of dancing and singing, and it's just a, a, a wonderful good time. Yeah. Well, I didn't even know of Jack Donahue. Um, the, the sad thing for most people is... Uh, aficionados of the theater might know him. Um, there's a wonderful book called Vaudeville, which does, um, um, incite, it's almost an encyclopedia of performers, and there's a little blurb in there about him. Um, unfortunately, the advent of uh, film and and recording, there, there wasn't much of it uh, turn of the century, so there's no footage of him. And in a way, it was kind of good for us because we could take the contemporaries uh, of Jack Donahue who were influenced by him, like Jimmy Cagney and Ray Bolger and Buddy Ebsen and uh, um, and even Gene and Fred, um, Eleanor Powell, and we could pull all the wonderful things that they did that we thought 
were were possibly influenced by Jack and create Jack from the ground up. So it was it was a a, a great feeling to know that when you do a musical about Fred Astaire, you have to be as good a dancer. You have to dance exactly like Fred. But with this, we kind of had an opportunity to to give the audience our idea of what Jack might have been like. so look forward to this piece all year long. I've never enjoyed anticipation so much as I did with this show. We, we, we presented in the Nymph Festival. Uh, we, we did eight presentations and uh, the first week of October. And I, I had a good feeling that we were going to continue and the carrot was dangled and I kept thinking about it and hoping about it and then there was an email from Melanie we're going into the York we'll be there in the fall and I just I would just be in the shower and reliving the songs and reliving the moments and then uh, I was um, in rehearsal for nine to five here in New York and then we went out to LA for a difficult tech and uh, I just kept thinking oh but look what's waiting for me look what's waiting for me at the end it's a dream role a dream role it's up there with Dolly and Rose and Mame, and I'm so grateful that it's come my way. Well, let's talk about this role. You play Jack Donahue's mother mm. in this. For mm. our audience who's yet to buy tickets, talk about the role. She's, she's easy to understand. She is struggling economically. She has a husband who is chronically alcoholic and unreliable. She is physically strong and determined. She is a practicing Catholic. And her eldest son runs away from home and, and joins vaudeville instead of staying with the steady gig in town, which is the shipyard. How could he, how could he do this? And, and that, that is the role. Uh, off stage, but spoken to are the priest who advises her, are the women she works for. She's a laundress. In my own family history, my great-grandmother was an immigrant, and she was illiterate. And in classic immigrant fashion, her son uh, uh, was a, a businessman, and her grandson, my father, went to Harvard. And I am in the arts, which is one of the privileges of democracy and, and, and the road to America. And, and so my own family story uh, is, is very akin to what goes on in, in the script. The new thriller, Dust, has settled in for a run at the West Side Theater. We recently dropped by to chat with playwright Billy Goda, director Scott Ziegler, and the show's two stars, Richard Mazur and Hunter Foster. Dust is a power play that starts off as a battle of wills that escalates into a war for respect, the upper hand, and survival.
it started with, uh, I'm a fitness trainer at, working for myself and I was at a gym and uh, one of the clients actually complained about some dust on a vent and got very heated between he and the person that worked there. And I remember thinking, wow, I wonder what happens after I leave this gym between the two of them. And it was really just from something as insignificant as dust on a vent that I thought, wow, it's from this a lot of times that the catastrophes can occur, you know? And, and that's really where it came about, just from being in the gym that day and seeing two people butting heads and getting heated over something that inc inconsequential. And you see it all the time with road rage or, or, you know, just one little thing and all of a sudden everything comes apart. So that was, that was where it came from. What can I do with you, Mr. Stone? What's that? What? Up there. That? Yes. An air vent. What's in the air vent? Is this a trick question? Because I'm going to have to say air. That's dust. Ah, you misled me. How so? Well, you said what's in the vent, but you meant what's on. If you said what's on, I might have said dust. Is this a joke? You tell me. You pay what I'm paying to live here. You don't expect to have dust caked on a vent. Well, it's not caked. It's, it's dust. Look, I'll call housekeeping and I'll get someone to come clean it. Don't you think it's wrong? No, not at all. It's, it happens. Does it mean people aren't paying attention to detail? That this hotel isn't meeting its standards? Um, the rehearsal process, um, I think, was very collaborative. Um, Billy was incredibly open and generous and we would often all sit around and talk about possible rewrites or changes in the play and he would bring in new ideas for the play and we would try them in rehearsal and a lot of them we ended up keeping some of them we would try them in rehearsal and they were not necessarily where we wanted to go um, so there's a lot of that um, you know as I said the actors are spectacular and both Billy and I tried to give them a lot of room to play and to explore and to show us things about the play that maybe we didn't know right away um, so there was a lot of a lot of just playing and collaborating, talking about what worked, what didn't, tr experimentation, and um, moving it into the theater um, and bringing in the audience is always that is the most exciting part for me. I mean, I, I think that the job of a director really is to be the audience's proxy until the audience shows up, um, and you know, you as a director, you try as best you can to to feel how the audience is going to respond, how they're going to read what you've put on the stage, but you never know for sure until you see them watching it. So to have our first preview last night, to see that there were laughs, some laughs that we had hoped were there, some laughs we were surprised by, but certainly were very welcome to see they were there, um, to hear gasping here and there, I mean, that's that means you've done well, I think, is that when, when they are responding to the turns in the story and that, and that with that excitement and with that level of investment, um, that's when you start to really know how well you've, you've, as a group, as an ensemble, how well we've done our job. Uh, there are two characters who become enmeshed with each other over the tiniest possible thing, dust. And because of this, and because they're both constructed in such a way that they, neither of them, at that moment in time, feel it's possible to give up their position, back off, or change what they're doing, they get on this inexorable ride to something truly strange and, and scary. And um, what's, what's particularly nice about this is that as it's going on, I believe you can see moments in time all along the way where you just go, oh no, you didn't have to do that that way. If you had just said yes, or if you just said okay, or if you just, or if you just hadn't hit the ball back across the net, we wouldn't be going down this road. And that's very much the way life works, I think. And I think it's the way life works in relationships. Life works in relationships not only between individuals, but between nations, between um, uh, societies where, you know, one little misstep and then a failure to understand that there are other possible ways to proceed end up in these kind of tragic 
circumstances, and that's what we have here. And so it's about a little tiny thing. It's about dust, and it turns into this really big thing. And in a way, I think that's very, um, that has a lot of resonance for the world we live in. Take your damn hand off my paper. You should take a few deep breaths, relax. You seem awfully uptight. Your job's history. If I lose this job, he doesn't in there. Are you threatening me? I'm no deer in the headlights. And if I get you fired? It doesn't in there. <laughs> well, he's a recovering um, drug addict, and he went to prison, and he's trying to get his life back together. And um, he's working at a hotel, and uh, um, Richard Mazur, who plays um, the, the other character in this play, who he's a, uh, a rich man, and he's working out at, this, at the Essex Hotel, which I work at, and we have a little um, disagreement about a certain, you know, a certain amount of dust that's been caked on an air vent. And, you know, that kind of explodes into this amazing, you know, conflict between these two men. And uh, it just goes to show you that some, sometimes the smallest of things can, like, be, be blown out of proportion, become big things. And uh, that's basically, it's all, and it's also my battling of, of, of continual battling of my addiction and trying to get my life back on, on the right path. And this event is, is steering me off course. And so I'm doing whatever I can to stay on the right path. Talk about the rehearsal process. Well, you know, you, it, it's interesting with, especially with a play like play like this, which is obviously not a comedy. It's always fun and interesting to find out where the comedy is, and with any new piece, you know, you never know. I mean, even when, when we were doing *You're in Town*, we had no idea that *You're in Town* was going to have laughs, and it's the same the, the laughs that they had. And so, this is the same thing. You know, you you do a play, and it's a serious. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of serious stuff going on. I mean, there's drug addiction, and there's you know, obviously. Um, uh, People, would, you know, we have, we have guns and people get beat up and things like that. But the, I, I, what, I, what I realized is how funny it was, and I, that's something that we were all surprised that we were, we were backstage going, I can't believe that that got to laugh, that got to laugh. Oh my God, people are they're engaged with what's going on, and they're laughing. And because I always feel like you, you always need to find humor, and even in the darkest of pieces, it's always it's always good to find find some humor. I mean, Sweeney Todd is is I mean, it's like you know, there's so many funny moments in Sweeney Todd, and that's what Sondheim said, you know. You need, to, you need to find the comic moments will only make the more dramatic moments more powerful, so. Both our lives end with that trigger. It doesn't make any damn sense. <laughs> dust, fucking dust. Lincoln Center Theater has brought one of America's most beloved playwrights, Pulitzer Prize winner Horton Foote, back to Broadway with his latest, Dividing the Estate. Director Michael Wilson reunites his 2007 Primary Stages cast, including Elizabeth Ashley, Penny Fuller, and Gerald McGraney. Dividing the Estate, which is playing a limited engagement at the Booth Theater, is described as a human comedy about a family that must confront its past as it prepares for its future. San Antonio, any old place I call my home, I gotta go. I got Texas in my soul. Dallas, Fort Worth, San Angelo, Houston, Austin, or El Paso, I gotta go. I got Texas in my soul. It is there I know my place is. This first did this um, about five years ago, and the climate has changed. And I, I didn't realize how timely it would be about mortgages and, and incomes. And, and I thought I was listening to TV. But I was happy to, to see it so responded to. Talk about collaborating with your director, Michael Wilson, again, because you've worked with him numerous times. <clears throat> I have a story about Michael. Uh, I was, had been lecturing in North Carolina and um, was resting and 
this young man came up to me and he said, uh, I listened to the lecture and I like your plays and uh, I would like to ask your advice. And I said, I don't give advice. He said, well, but I said, I will, I'll, I'll listen to you. And if I feel there's something I could help you with, I'll speak. Well, he said, that was fine. So he said, well, my dilemma is I've just graduated from college and I have three decisions to make. Whether I'm going to the theater or television or movies. And I said, well, if you're asking what I would do, I'd take the stage. And that's what he did. And now we've worked together uh, four or five times. This is our fifth collaboration together. We've been working as director and playwright for the last 11 years, but previously we did work together at Lincoln Center Theater with the Carpetbaggers Children, and that was six years ago at the Missy New House with Hallie, uh, and um, and then of course uh, Dame Lee Married at Primary Stages in 2004. But it's 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 great to come back to this play, which is really his homage to the Cherry Orchard, and and really uh, kind of dig deeper and realize some deeper layers of this play. I just love the way everybody in this family changes subjects. I made a statement earlier about dividing the estate. And that's just because you've been drinking, Lewis. You always talk that way when you're drinking. Well, Mama, I'm sick and tired of having to go to my nephew for the least thing. Son, I need $10 or 15 or 20 Why? Well, because I spend my allowance too soon this month. Why? Because it's none of your goddamn business. Well, shut up. Don't, why? Don't, don't, well, Mama, don't, don't, every time don't, I go. I knew I was going to talk that way. Uh, well, originally, uh, Wendy Phillips, um, who I worked with on a show called Promised Land and who's ha Hallie Foote's best friend, called me and said that the Foots were trying to get in touch with me about a play. And I said, well, go ahead, give them the number. In the meantime, somebody from Elizabeth Ashley called and said, there's a play. I want you to come do this play with me. And then Mr. Foote got on the phone with me and asked if I would do this play. And it's like, how do you turn that down? You can't possibly. I, I told my friend Jameson Parker about this. He said, if you turn down the opportunity to work with Horton Foote and Elizabeth Ashley, you're dumber than a red brick, and I don't want to know you. So, you know, and he was absolutely right. How, do you, uh, how does an actor turn something like that down? You can't. Not that I ever, it never crossed my mind to do such a thing. I jumped at the opportunity. Well, look what's happening today. It's kind of about what's happening today with, you know, the financial markets and people over overextending in terms of their lifestyle. And it's just very prescient. When he wrote it, he wrote it in 87. He's sort of modified certain things, but it's basically the play it was in 87. And I don't know, my father just sort of connected to something that's happening right now. What I love about this play is it's so human and it's so familiar and we can all see ourselves and our families in it and you know get impatient with our own flaws and their flaws and also forgiving and it's so funny and there's not a joke in it it's funny because it's it's people and what we all do and my character poor old Lucille Lucille is the she's the kind of decent center and she's not the fun razzmatazz part that my sister Mary Jo is, that Hallie Foote plays. She's the decent center who kind of holds it all together. She takes care of Mama. She makes sure everybody's all right. It's not typecasting. It's perfect today. There's actually we found a Houston Post headline or Houston Chronicle saying son is in deep trouble for blowing the estate and having to go to probate from just a couple of days ago. And it's the same thing as what's going on in the play. But it was a headline in the paper actually. And talk about working with this great ensemble. Oh, they're all fun. Everybody in there is great. So I steal from everybody. I learn from all of us. They all have something really good to take. For God's sake, call the man about the oil leak. What oil leak? <laughs> An oil leak on the estate. Hasn't some told 
you? No, ma'am. I want no oil wells or gas wells cluttering up my land. They poison the land. They ruin it forever. Oh, that is so foolish, Mama. Oh, when my father was alive, they tried to drill the oil on our land. Well, oh, he went out there. He took his shotgun. And he said, you get off this land of mine or I will blow your brains out. Well, I mean, it's thrilling because it's a great brand new American play by a great American writer with a great American director and this great cast with a and it's got story and it's got plot and it speaks to exactly everything that's happening in America right now here today and oddly enough these people kind of find a solution <laughs> of sorts. It's it's uh, it's wonderful. It's one. It's amazing for me as an audience member. He wrote this in the late '80s. It is more relevant now. It's freaky, isn't it? I mean, you would think the play was written yesterday, except plays this good don't get written the day before. But I mean, it's it, it's I would the first time when we did it at primary stages a year ago. You know, in the little teeny stage and. I mean, I kept thinking, man, this this play is like right now, right here, and now. I mean, if look, look at the last two months in American life, and this play addresses itself to that heart of darkness with a little bit of light in there. And first, that it's funny. Don't you think it's funny? <laughs> I see only smiling faces, and so... Partner, the rest of the world's not worth a pound of good old Texas dirt. I gotta go. I got Texas in my soul. I gotta go. I got Texas in my soul. 